Um, so within this uh, presentation, I'm going to be talking about a, a variety of um, particular uh, particular needs uh, uh, which arise within the health space for modeling and some particular responsive um, uh, approaches we've been taking to uh, to address some of these needs. Um, uh, so, you know, the context I argued was um, in the past slide was a great deal of challenges, and I didn't really characterize it, but I'd say that broadly speaking, many of the challenges in the health space are growing ever more complex. We have a growing occurrence of antibiotic resistant uh, organisms, including bugs, carpobiums that are uh, resistant drugs that are that are challenging us because they they are evading the the antibiotics of last resort. Um, we have um, uh, we have situations where increasingly our efforts of infection control and, and facilities are being thwarted by uh, by nasty um, uh, AMRs, uh, antimicrobial resistant organisms. We have syndemics. We see. Um, cases of community after community where they're subject not only to uh, epidemic levels of, of uh, one um, uh, health burden, say STIs, but uh, also of, uh, of uh, associated with uh, domestic violence or issues associated with addictions, um, uh, issues associated with chronic disease conditions. I've done a lot of my work in Canada in the area of, of um, health of our Aboriginal peoples, and um, there you're seeing, uh, you know, terrible rates, upwards of 50% of, of diabetes prevalence within um, the oldest age groups, uh, 55 and, and older for for women, um, uh, together with uh, very high rates associated with um, many other chronic and and communicable diseases. So we have these syndemics that are increasingly uh, increasingly facing us when we're trying to um, improve the health of populations. Uh, the aging of the population and the, the increasing occurrence of comorbidities, um, the fact that hot spotting in many facilities for emergency intake is associated with with individuals from um, comor with comorbid conditions and with um, uh, with uh, with uh, mental health um, mental health issues as well, we increasingly have uh, attention on zoonotics, uh, emerging infectious diseases like um, SARS, um, Ebola, um, which cross the animal human interface H1N1 flu, um, and uh, generally there's a lot of lot of thought that um, you know the challenges there will be growing because of developmental issues. It's its tie-in with um, with it, with uh, the growing development of, of forest areas around the world, um, the interconnectedness of the world, the fact that I'm here um, addressing you, um, is a reflection of the uh, global context of travel and its ability to bring in these tight pods of of uh, hermetically sealed um, um, pathogen that that airplanes can be. They fly from one place to another and inject inject people with conditions into a new population. We have uh, a lot of connections going on globally that can spread bugs like Ebola, previously regional in their reach uh, across the world. Intergenerational epigenetic effects, uh, which are believed to play a role, and a growing awareness of the effects of critical, uh, critical periods in the life course, certainly. Um, uh, multiple outcome on multiple um, complication conditions such as diabetes and, and, and metabolic syndrome, and ever more nimble corporate actors. Um, corporate actors that, whether it's in the tobacco space or big food space or big pharma space, you know, are, are really mining in very um, uh, clever um, and uh, quite uh, quite scary ways sometimes. The, the growing number of non-traditional channels for, for marketing and for promotion, um, advertising to kids online, uh, advertising uh, through couponing to people for tobacco to systematically counteract anti-tobacco campaigns, personalized marketing that takes advantage of people's uh, uh, background and that leverages that information and tailors the messages just for them within the corporate space. So when we aim at these interventions that these fixes that we want to stay fixed, um, to use Jeff's uh, phrase for it. Um, uh, 
there's a variety of, of needs that come to the fore that um, colleagues of mine in the health space have identified. Um, the presence of a longitudinal perspective, a life course perspective, um, to really understand uh, impact of early life insults on the life course or um, investments, how they ripple out through the life course. Um, uh, the, the possibility of exploiting networks, some of the work that um, Alan Scheel has done, uh, both in Canada here and in Penny Ha, um, in, um, in complex interventions that intervene on, on networks, that shape networks, and that use network information to target interventions. Um, the realization that by targeting a small subset of the population, we can have a disproportionate impact in terms of health health burden of certain types of conditions um, has, has really given rise to an understanding of the importance of heterogeneity. Since the work of, uh, of Heftoad in York in the 1980s with gonorrhea, for example, um, the realization has been, is, has been that you know, a lot of the game is about that core group. It's about the core network that, of people that are highly connected, that um, have uh, sexual risk behaviors that put them at particular risk of exposure to bugs, that that's a lot of where the game's going to be won um, in the STI front. Um, the importance of context and relationships when it comes to, whether it comes to postpartum depression or dementia, a lot of the issue is not just about the individual who's suffering that condition, but about their their uh, caregiving support networks, um, their relationships with those caregivers, and maintaining those relationships can make all the difference in in um, in offsetting the the time of institutionalization or or the need or, or the risk that they will that their care will fall through the cracks. The importance of of understanding micro behaviors to inform modeling and to inform an understanding of of really what's driving people to um, to relapse and smoking or to fall back into alcohol uh, dependency. Um, uh, it, there's growing interest in, in sort of being able to, to, to recognize exactly what's going on in terms of the stimuli that lead to this so that you can head off some of those risks or better support those individuals, whether it's in the form of quit lines or through, um, through uh, smaller scale interventions, particular for that person. Um, and then um, the fact that in so many of our um, so many of our interventions, the behavioral response of individuals plays such a key role in, in governing the success or lack thereof in terms of our of our efforts to improve health has put a premium on understanding um, uh, human behavior and its response to incentives, response to um, to the policy context. We're going to be talking about a set of methodological um, needs as well that, that I'll be explaining as the, as the uh, time comes on with respect to particular, um, uh, particular needs on the modeling front, which um, help improve the ability of our models to deliver value. So I'm going to be going through a set of these needs and matching them to particular modeling emphases that, that you'll see played out in the course of the week. And the first of them, um, is going to emphasize a bunch of those shown in red. And for each, I'm going to highlight the things in red that are addressed by this effort, these types of efforts or these types of emphases, and then we'll talk about their implications. And the first of them is agent-based modeling. Um, uh, I, I, I'm a, a pluralist practitioner um, when it comes to multiple modeling approaches. Um, increasingly, we weave, weave together multiple modeling approaches, which we'll be talking about, but um, I also have found that particularly for uh, certain areas of my work, so work involving health disparities, social determinants of health, uh, work involving um, spread of, of communicable illnesses, agent-based modeling uh, offers really formidable strengths. And many of the models we'll be seeing in the course of the week um, demonstrate these strengths. The capacity to represent situated perception on the part of agents, um, the fact that an individual from a poor background who wants to go to university um, lacks the social capital to to uh, secure often good advice about um, about to which universities to to apply or the implications of of uh, 
uh, aiming at one area of, of, of the university versus another for admission. Um, the impacts and decision making and learning of that individual's particular context, being able to anticipate these these factors can be very important for for um, designing effective interventions. Capturing longitudinal progression is something that agent-based modeling can do because it focuses on the individual. Agent-based modeling um, captures longitudinal and cross-sectional depictions of a population, whereas more aggregate models, for example, traditionally system dynamics gives cross-sectional depictions of a population over time. Here, within the context of agent-based modeling, we can represent spatial um, context uh, networks. We can situate people in GIS in a context informed by GIS information. And we can represent heterogeneity on the part of an individual in the form of, of for example, multiple comorbidities um, or um, fine-grained uh, fine consequences associated with interventions, for example, transfer effects from one subgroup to another. Um, all of these factors end up supporting highly targeted policy planning. So we can aim at interventions that, for example, take into account a person's history or take into account a person's particular characteristics. In this age, we're increasingly talking about individualized medicine. Um, we can capture aspects of their social network that might allow us to sort of aim a peer intervention specifically at individuals who are vulnerable because of their, their network context. Um, and we can capture aspects of their relationship dynamics with caregivers. So I talked with you earlier about some of the, the work people have done in multiple contexts, and agent-based modeling can capture these contexts, whether it's spatial, multi-scale, um, or individuals within, uh, within networks, and can capture very comfortably and as scalably the occurrence of comorbidities in the form of, of one individual. Um, a second uh, component that I want to uh, stress is seminal to the, to the, to the um, teaching of this uh, event and my boot camps um, uh, worldwide, and that is this issue of um, helping individuals, particularly from health background with no computational experience, um, work with models that are quite sophisticated in ways that are still transparent to them. Um, traditionally, Within the, um, within the modeling context, um, uh, a lot of the models that we'll be seeing this week would have been completely inscrutable because the, the how of these models, describing the plumbing of them, as it were, the putting in place the computational mechanisms to, to get it to work would have obscured what is being represented. It would have meant looking at computer code, which is just not going to be meaningful to people who are not from computer background. And increasingly, with tools like AnyLogic, and AnyLogic most notably by a long shot, um, we're dealing with graphical languages that allow people from whatever background to focus on the underlying what is being characterized in the model and, and uh, having transparency of that model so that it can serve as a, as a boundary object for people from multiple backgrounds, term I'll, I'll come back to in a few minutes. Um, so. Um, you know, in, in areas like system dynamics, we've long had a tradition of building up models at the qualitative level and quantitative level out of pieces that people from a variety of backgrounds can understand. So we use causal loop diagrams to indicate the relationship between different factors um, within a system. The fact that, say, increasing diabetic pregnancies, all other things being equal, will tend to increase the, the risk of recurrent gestational diabetes within a, a, in a mother for future pregnancies. Um, or we draw out stock and flow diagrams um, that, that characterize uh, the population at any one time and characterize through these flows uh, people's movement between different health states, say from an overweight health state and through a pregnancy becoming pregnant in an overweight state, but uh, for, for women who don't have a gestational diabetes history. So within a system dynamics model, we have this way graphically of showing the model, and these stocks represent subgroups of the population, and the flows represent transitions between those groups, and people will flow over time from one health state, say, to another, gaining weight, losing weight, for example. Um, 
And we can draw quite large models often in fairly understandable fashions. Um, I apologize, the, the fonts are small here. But it provides us a way to show individuals from all sorts of backgrounds our model and to secure their input into it. Um, similarly, discrete event modeling has long used a, um, a very visual depiction of these workflow processes uh, on which it, it centers. By contrast, agent-based models have long used things that are quite inscrutable to individuals. So computer code like this, which performs functions, and someone from computational background could look at this and have some understanding about what it's doing, but for most people, it's going to be completely inscrutable. It will be as if I provided the model to you in hieroglyphics and expected you to make sense of it. And until just a few years ago, this was the state of the art in agent-based modeling, putting together models in that form. Fortunately, we're in a new world, and any logic has been at the forefront of, of changing the state of the art in this area um, to support this sort of declarative focus, this focus on, on the what and less of the how and bringing that to agent-based models. Um, so rather than this, we move to a situation where we can visually depict a model, where we can have a state chart, as it's called, that depicts uh, an individual's progression among various health states and other components that depict their aging process, for example, and other components that are described with characterizing their movement in the population. In this case, it's not a person, but a, uh, a deer. Um, and this visually describes the behavior of a deer in a way that is parsable with a bit of guidance that you'll receive during this week, you st starting tomorrow, you can kind of take an understanding like this and make sense of it. You can read the names, the labels, um, these arrows of different sorts of very particular meanings associated with them, and they compare very favorably to something like this. So we're in a new world when it comes to agent-based modeling, a world that's very visual, a world where we can depict the model while we're building it, and while it's being run, in a way that, um, uh, that can make sense to individuals um, across uh, interdisciplinary teams. So we, so we can have, for example, state charts, uh, which might capture patient flow and emergency department issues in a, in a simple model in that area. And this model is built up alongside those from health background. We can depict a wide variety of factors related to diabetic end-stage renal disease in terms that, um, that refer to domain concepts like hemo, being in a hemodialysis uh, status or, or, or in a situation where you're, you're, um, you're uh, engaged in peritoneal dialysis, uh, where individuals have functioning kidneys or are put into a state where they're deemed not suitable for a transplant, et cetera. Um, so we have these very visual models coming about, and the situation is, is improving such that that um, within a team, we can have the model built up not by the modeler, but by a variety of people from different backgrounds, people who know different areas of the system well, people who understand the intervention space or policy space very well, um, and an expert uh, who understands the mechanisms of the model well, and they can collaborate to put together a model that's, genu that's genuinely um, something where the whole is greater than the sum of the parts, um, where it captures insights from all of them and puts them together to, to gain great insight. Um, next component, though, I'm going to be talking about is leveraging that and using that in an interdisciplinary basis. So traditionally, models have been built by expert modelers somewhere out there often and delivered um, in the form of either advice or in the form of black boxes. So I'd like to talk about the three modeling eras. Um, the first, um, um, first seen um, in many ways with uh, work that went on in the earliest stages of, of uh, system dynamics modeling, and I believe uh, some similar work in the, in the very first uh, opening eras of discrete event modeling, was sort of consult with us and we'll bring you the answer. Describe to us your problem. Give us some requisite information, and we will give you some advice. It'll be good advice, we promise. Um, here you have generalist modelers 
who wouldn't specialize in health. I mean, why cut down their income by only specializing in health? They'd, they just, you know, they one week they consult on railroad operations and, oh, now you want me to model a hospital? Sure, I can do that. Um, done that before. Um, pretty similar to that manufacturing plant I did last, last week. Um, and, uh, and here we have the modelers sort of being the, um, the conduits for the insights in terms of advice. Secondly, in an era that's still very flourishing within the Canadian context, you have models distributed as black boxes. So Statistics Canada is most famous for this. They have a very rich model, poem. Um, I'm very close colleagues with and good friends with the person who, who uh, helped make that possible, Michael Wilson, who's a modeler of great esteem. Um, but the model is delivered as a black box. It's delivered as kind of a, a souped up crystal ball. You, I'll give it to you and you can run it through a very prescribed uh, user interface. You can, you can enter information that you want to see with a few, a few um, sort of options and it will spit out for you answers. As to what the assumptions are of it, as to what exactly um, it, it is using to make those, uh, those, those predictions, that's often pretty obscure to those using it. The model is seen as the artifact that delivers value. It's the model that's delivered to you is where the value comes from, and, um, and you use that in a very um, limited set of, of options. Finally, um, I think we're entering now this era of, of what I call agile modeling. This is collaborative, adaptive modeling conducted in interdisciplinary teams where the models are built alongside the end users. They're built by teams that include the end users with the modeler typically embedded within those teams or working very closely with them to the degree they can't be said to be the only person building the model. Um, and the model is evolved over time and delivers value and learning over time in a way that shapes its future evolution. So the, the model is, is grown in a more organic way, in a way that captures kind of the current best understanding of the situation. The model's kind of a living document that evolves with learning. And rather than being built by someone out there and delivered to us in the form of insights or in the form of a black box, this is something where diverse people through this team can understand, can interact with, even if they couldn't have built it up themselves from scratch, they could run novel scenarios with it. They could change this assumption. They could even um, ask what if situations that are more intricate with it, ones that aren't anticipated in any way by the modeler, and they can, shell, they can shape what information it provides to them. So here we're dealing with a new era of modeling. In many ways, that's what brings us together here. It's tools like AnyLogic that, that bring us the ability to, to conduct work at that level. The, the picture here of, is something I alluded to earlier in my last talk, models as thinking tools. They help us make learn more quickly from the evidence that's available, more quickly, more reliably, more deeply. We can figure out the degree to which that evidence jives, jives with our understanding about how things work in the world so that we can more quickly find when there's inconsistencies. We think you know, the network works this way with injection drug users in, in the city, but we find through the model that if you put those assumptions in, it doesn't jive with the empirical evidence. Something doesn't add up, and it forces you to question your understanding and potentially question the evidence. Quite a few times I find a lack of driving, and I found it greatly enhances the model, and what comes out of it is a much improved understanding in the form of the model. In several other cases, I found that what comes out of it is when the model doesn't match up, it's an issue with the data. And no one had really noticed it, but the data had inconsistencies in it. It had redefinitions. Um, it, had, um, it had incompleteness that had gone uh, latent and hadn't been picked up uh, in some cases previously. So here, um, we're actually making use of empirical evidence. Sometimes you'll hear a fa false dichotomy out there. You model or you're doing analysis of you know, the, the data that's available. The model captures the data, puts it together under one roof, 
and helps, helps you reason about it in a deeper way. It helps you leverage that empirical evidence to greatest effects. So I showed this slide earlier with system dynamics modeling, but I believe it carries over for any of the three sorts of models, system science models, we'll be talking about this week. Now, a key part of this is this notion of incremental model development, where the model is not built up in um, one fell swoop. It's not, it's not that we envision a model two years from now that's good and, and has all these features and, and will capture all this richness, and we just work towards it all that time, and then two years from now we get our model in hand. Instead, modeling is best conducted in a highly incremental way where we add small pieces to it and we learn from the results and based on that learning we decide what to do next. Over the course of the two years, you're, you're going to end up with a model that's probably going to be very different than what you would have anticipated two years earlier and different in a good way. It's going to have focused on certain things which proved really promising investigated certain unexpected phenomena which came up. But moreover, it's going to be a much more solid model because you're going to, by building it up and adding these things in bit by bit, you're going to have a much better appreciation for where interesting behavior is coming from and you're going to be able to spot problems with the model much sooner. Rather than waiting for the bigger, better model and you run it and you see strange behavior, you don't know where it's coming from, if it's a problem, is, is it a bug, is it a, is it a mistake in the model, or is it a real phenomenon? Here, by building it up bit by bit by bit, you get, you can head those things off early if it's a bug, you can find interesting behavior sooner and take advantage of it. So these incremental versions offer often a lot of value in terms of confidence about the model and understanding how where its behavior is coming from. But they often can be demonstrated to system stakeholders, can be used for feedback, and they can be shared with the team, which is good for morale, but also good for, for bringing new ideas to the table. Um, so there's a wide variety of benefits for incremental development. You can find these slides on, on the, the Google Drive site. Like a lot of material, I don't have time to go into them, but it's one of the most valuable pieces of advice I can give you. Don't build for that bigger, better model a long time for now. Build it up step by step by step, learning from it all through the process and checking it against as things change to make sure that it's, it's giving uh, behavior that's, um, uh, that makes sense. The point here is that often it's the modeling process as well, not just the model that delivers value. If, you, if the model itself that you built up were to suddenly disappear due to a hard drive crash, often you will have secured great value from the modeling process. It's allowed your mental models of the situation to be improved, but it also forces reflection what's known and what's not known. It brings to the four different perspectives, and it catalyzes the team. So we've conducted a lot of our work, looking back, in a model, in a participatory context, where we work alongside um, those from, almost always from health science background. They could be clinicians, they could be, um, PhDs in public health, they could be epidemiologists, they could be biostatisticians, um, they could be individuals from social science background. We work alongside them to, to build our models. And the key enabler here, folks, is this notion of a model as a boundary object. It's something that when you get this sort of visual model in hand and you can point to it, you can have different parties that are basically talking about the same underlying model and what, how it's behaving. They're, they're talking about the same underlying artifact. And as a result, it can be a meeting place for people from different backgrounds to discuss the common sort of set of issues that bind them together. So you can get those from the Ministry of Health that are experts in this particular aspect of emergency room handling at the same table as the, the people who know about the community care options, and they can all point to the model and talk about its behavior and, and ask questions about it. So having this common point of understanding, having this common point of reference, can really ease communication and sharing of insights. So the model here is, is a, um, a nexus for this interdisciplinary, uh, interdisciplinary group, and it's sort of the watering hole where they come together to share ideas, to share knowledge, to share insights that relate to the external system. It's kind of this, 
this um, um, uh, allegory for the external system that they keep on coming back to and can use to sort of bring out relevant insights for, for real world application. Um, and the, the big uh, realization here is that the modeling approach you use, for example, this incremental approach and the software you apply, visual tools like AnyLogic compared to, compared to a tool which forces you to just deal with computer code created by some modeler in a back office, this has a major impact on your capacity to use models in this way. It's precisely because you can use it in a visual way that you can speak to the whole team. And increasingly, we try to get the, the modeler, the programmer, out of the learning loop. So the, you don't have to go supplicate yourself to the programmer and say, could you add this to the model's outputs? Could you create a chart which does this? That should be your folks' ability. Anywhere in this room should be able to take one of these models and say, I want to build a scenario that looks at this. And for most scenarios, that should be something you're able to do. And you should be able to say, I'd like to look at this output, which no one had looked at yet. Let's wire that up to the model. And that's what we're trying to accomplish in many ways in the course of these training events. It's not necessarily to have everyone being able to build the model from the ground up. It's to be able to work with it in a facile fashion that avoids you having to spend a long time money um, and, and delays associated with, with getting someone else to, to add things to this model. It lets you work with it in a tight loop, learning loop. Um, so we're seeking to, to enable this more broadly in some of our work to enable people to select their own outputs in a very flexible fashion when they, re when they receive the model, not even without even ha changing the model itself. A final um, component that I really want to emphasize and that's core to a lot of our work is going beyond the situation where we have fragmented system science methods. I stand before you with good news. The good news is that the years of competing uh, tribes for system science are rightfully drawing to, a, to an end in the sense that it's no longer a matter of choosing one technique or another alone. It's a, it's a matter of being able to weave them together with rich models. So those three types of techniques I talked about, these used to be menu items uh, that you would say, okay, I'm going to build the system dynamics model, and because it's in system dynamics, it's going to stay system dynamics. So I'm going to build an agent-based model, and that's my you know, permanent commitment methodologically for this area or discrete event modeling. And there's this very siloed sense of system science. You were an agent-based modeler, or you were a system dynamicist, or you were a discrete event modeler. And um, there would be like ships passing in the night in terms of knowledge uh, uh, spread between them. There was almost no individuals who knew multiple of these approaches or all of these approaches. Um, the realization is these techniques are highly complementary. No one technique replaces the others entirely. And there are significant synergies uh, associated with combining them. Um, why do you, how would you combine them? Um, well, each offers a comparative advantage for characterizing certain phenomena. But beyond that, there's often different analysis needs across different regions of a model. Some regions of a model you, model you want to model in more detail. Some you're willing to allow the a higher level of a higher level of, of abstraction, a higher level of you know less comparatively less detail. Your focus is on this particular area of the system. Um, maybe it's the um, referrals between rehabilitation facilities, um, sending people back to, to home care. Um, that's really where you want to focus your modeling effort. You might use a rather coarse-grained depiction of the rest of the system. Or maybe you want to be able to evolve over time which areas have detail and which don't as you learn from the system about what's really important. Maybe your stakeholders relate to certain of these approaches more than others for different regions of the model. Or maybe you just want computational efficiencies. Why build a really fancy agent-based model for an area that, um, that it's going to be representing most of the population and therefore really slow it down? Um, and finally, often we, we want to describe a system at different levels. So uh, in a separate talk, I'll have five compelling hybrid model patterns. For example, patterns, we want to capture a service facility, a service unit. Maybe it's a, um, 
it's a hospital, maybe it's a long-term care facility, um, maybe it's a, um, a, a convalescent home. Um, and we want to look at this interaction between the service provision and the population, the health of the population. We want to be able to examine what factors are driving people to present for care at certain times from this population based on the underlying epidemiology um, and uh, attitudes towards care seeking. But we also want to be able to examine the impacts of the service provision on the quality and quantity of care offered, the timeliness of that care, and the impact on people's health status. And when people go back to the population due to inadvertent early discharge, we want to be able to capture the fact that they may represent in an even more serious state within a day or two. So this is an example of service population inter uh, intervention uh, interaction that we can capture in a hybrid model. Discrete event modeling for the service, for the service unit, perhaps agent-based modeling or system dynamics modeling for the broader population. Or you might have an at-risk population which uh, is represented um, uh, in an individual-based fashion, but you have an upstream population, maybe those who are normal glycemic, even before prediabetes, who are represented in an aggregated fashion. They're, only the essential details are captured in a system dynamics model. And then at some point, they turn into individuals. They butt off into particular people with rich networks, with situated locations, when they become prediabetic. Um, and so they flow into the state where they are suddenly individuals and uh, they're first class citizens of the models and they're followed as individuals thereafter. Um, or perhaps we, we want agents who incorporate system dynamics within them to characterize the dynamics of their immune systems or, or their response to in terms of uh, risk attitude and, and uh, risk perception associated with exposure to a communicable illness. So we represent continuous dynamics with system dynamics within an agent, use the agents within their networks and situated in space. These are all possible with any logic, and we'll be coming back to look at particular examples of these. Um, I have some references in this area where work has been going on, and it's a rapidly maturing area, a rapidly developing area, um, where many people are, are getting into this uh, this domain and where um, Wintersim, for example, is now two years in a row formulating um, uh, sessions specifically on hybrid modeling. So hybrid modeling has been uh, used to great effects in very different ways with different configurations about what's in an agent, what's at an aggregate level, uh, etc. cetera. Um, another need is anticipating and, and incentivizing certain behavioral effects. The traditional fact is that in a lot of models, most models that are out there, people's choice behavior has been very uh, crudely represented. And yet we know with intervention after intervention, whether it's promotion of a vaccination, whether it's um, promotion or uh, examination of the impacts of care delivery um, innovations, whether it's factors having to do with um, uh, with chronic disease management, people's behavior and their choices, their choices of what treatment regimen to select, their choices about whether to present for care and when to present for care, the, their choices about whether to vaccinate their children, these are often at the heart of the effectiveness of our intervention. If we're not able to address these things, we may find that we have the best vaccination strategy in the world. Uh, in terms of uh, the facilities, in terms of the, uh, the workflow, but people aren't showing up with their kids and it puts them at risk of measles or other childhood infectious diseases down the road. Traditionally, models have underplayed this. The, the representations of people's behavior have been very, very simplistic. Um, and uh, the, good, the good news here is that particularly individual-based models, agent-based models are highly attractive at representing individuals in certain situated circumstances with certain preferences. They can be associated with preferences, they can be associated with history of exposure to actual choices and their learning from that exposure. And, and yet, traditionally most agent-based uh, agent models have featured almost uh, automaton-like agents that just decide things probabilistically in a way that's totally cognitively implausible. The good news here is that um, 
through the leadership of Jeff, who's been working on this for, gosh, 10 to 15 years now, I think, um, working at bringing this nexus together. Um, I think he first started talking with Sensoc folks, what, over 10 years ago. Um, uh, it's been increasingly clear that tools from that are traditionally used in the dark side, um, I mean marketing, um, are, are applicable to be translated into the health space. So this tool of random utility theory, which undermines or un, excuse me, it underpins um, uh, a lot of the ad campaigns you see on the, see out there. Um, perhaps undermines a lot of health uh, uh, health status uh, issues, but um, it underpins a lot of our marketing. Um, can actually be readily adapted and is being readily adapted by folks like Terry Flynn or by Joffrey Swait in his collaboration with Liz Brook of Michigan to to look at health issues and and decision making involving health. Um, these are incredibly complementary approaches. Discrete choice theory gives us an understanding about how people make decisions over time um, based on their preferences, based on the choice sets available to them at that time. And it provides a sophisticated way of eliciting preferences that's been tested in wide varieties of marketing contexts to, to, to really understand how people are likely to behave empirically. Agent-based modeling, by, contact, by contrast, can capture the avail ability of changing choice sets, um, experiences that change over time as an individual um, uh, engages in certain choice behavior, their exposure to the outcomes, for example, of, of uh, choosing different uh, uh, presentation to care options or, or treatment options, and they can capture also influence of other people, potentially on agent preferences or their particular uh, physical context. Their exposures in terms of, of uh, messaging, for example, on the health side, both uh, adverse and positive. Um, and they can capture um, aspects of, of uh, the impact of the choices on subsequent uh, agent, um, agent dynamics, subsequent agent health state, for example. So um, Terry has very, uh, very uh, fruitfully and valuably mapped out sort of some of the uh, the ways in which agent-based model, or excuse me, uh, random utility theory, and capturing the sort of hierarchy of decision making on the part of an agent, their selection of different options, et cetera, how that can be applied within the agent-based modeling context. And Jeff, um, through his leadership has done the first work applying this in the um, workflow modeling context for optometry here in Australia, in work that I, I was honored to be part of um, in a lesser capacity, and, uh, and has shown you know, essentially how this could be work used in the context of any logic models to model cognitively sort of more realistic decision making on the part of um, um, the, the matching of optometry students with, with job opportunities. Um, there's a whole theory behind this. I don't have time to go into this. There's many different formulations which have their trade-offs uh, in random utility theory. But one of the big insights is that through use of standardized survey instruments that, that are, are really honed within random utility theory methods, you can elicit preferences of individuals for different options on the part of these agents so that they will have a certain preference based on the pricing of, of a of a procedure, maybe it's a dental procedure, choosing a crown or an implant versus a, um, uh, you know, a, um, a prosthesis. Um, and uh, the preferences might relate to things like cost. They might relate to things like um, the, um, the durability of it. They might relate to things such as the, uh, the aesthetics of it. Um, and they might ultimately be things that, um, that also in, uh, affect their decision making vis-a-vis -vis the, the preferences of other people around them. So random utility theory provides a way of estimating these betas, which can then be plugged into the agent-based model to shape uh, individual behavior within that model. So you can have a population of agents that are grounded with empirical data gathered on real-world preferences that people seem to be applying out there in the world, and you can ask what if questions about interventions that might incentivize certain behaviors, provide rewards for a certain type of, of behavior, or, or disincentives for other behavior, um, 
and, and see how it plays out in agent behavior. Um, this is an intensely interdisciplinary area itself, random utility theory, discrete choice theory, uh, combining elements of economics, psychology, marketing, statistics, and um, it has a great deal of promise in combined with, with agent-based models. Um, finish, getting close to finishing up here, one of the other uh, areas which we've we focus is, is, is what, I, what I like to call um, uh, humble, humble modeling. Um, and that is a reflection, it's modeling with humility. It's a reflection of the fact that I stand before you um, a, uh, a skeptical modeler, a jet lagged skeptical modeler, but a skeptical modeler nonetheless. Um, and um, uh, some people respond to jet lag with unlimited optimism, but, uh, but uh, I, I retain my skepticism in my jet lag. And the issue here is that often we build models as hypotheses about how things might be in the world. And they are learning tools. They help us more quickly think through and spot inconsistencies with our understanding. But they are not to be trusted in a faith-based way with, with uh, guiding the future of our decisions. And instead, if the situation where models have traditionally been built, calibrated and then used from then on and trusted, um, I, I seek a, instead a situation where these models automatically are updated to include the new evidence, the very latest understanding, and which take into account the fact that as new data comes in, the model should be consistent with it. The model's understanding of the current situation at the least should be updated accordingly. So, you know, traditionally within modeling, we've built a model up front, and often that's been done by someone in a, well, I was going to say back closet, but that's not, that's not what they put us in traditionally. Um, but uh, someone else elsewhere to the organization that brought back as a black box um, and, and then employed, and, and then it's used in your organization. And this scenario is fraught with lots of problems, um, but one of the problems is that it's often very painful to sort of reopen that model, to, to improve it, to get it back into alignment with the latest evidence. It may be built with the very finest of ingredients when it's first rolled out, the very finest of data from you know, top quality meta-analyses from around the world, but by the time you use it three years later, it's getting out of date. And the modeler involved uh, may no longer have been kept up with the model, and the model's getting more and more outdated. And even the best of models, the models built with the most recent of evidence, they're going to go, they're going to become, uh, uh, they're going to become obsolete in terms of their understanding of the situation. They're going to increasingly depart from what's uh, viewed in the world and the traditional way of approaching this. Um, the analogy that I like to give here is, um, is, is one that points to students' day-to-day -day experiences. Um, uh, so I'm sure most people in the room have an extremely refined mental model, a very, very good mental model about how to go from your workplace or place of study to your home. You know how to go between them extremely well. And yet, you don't trust that mental model with, to guide you perfectly home every day with your eyes closed. You want to keep your eyes open for a lot of good reasons. Because they're stochastic. You're uncertain about the traffic, exactly when that stoplight will be green. You're uncertain about when that truck will be barreling down and, and might not stop at the crosswalk. You're, you're, you're increasingly uh, unsure about exactly where you are as you're going home. And there's gaps in completeness. You didn't have that construction in your mental model. You didn't have that crack in the sidewalk or what have you. Um, the point is that we can have very, very good models, but we're savvy enough in the real world to keep our eyes open. And the question that I have for you is, why shouldn't we be doing the same thing? Why are we engaged so much in blind simulation models? Let's keep our models with their eyes open. Let's keep them taking in the latest evidence. And fortunately, there's a whole set of techniques for doing this, which go back many, many decades, um, and that provide benefits to the models by leveraging data. It also improves the capacity to leverage that data because it, it incorporates that 
for immediate use in decision making. By, by regrounding our models, we can then look forward, ask what if questions that we can't ask of the data in and of itself. Data is great. Data tells us about the current situation, but it's like, it's kind of like trying to make decisions based on data alone. It's like trying to drive looking out the back window. You know what's occurred till now. You know what has happened, but you often want to ask the what ifs about counterfactual situations. What if we did this? We've never done it before. What if we undertook this new intervention? How would that look? What if we used the best practice from Brisbane down here in Adelaide? You know, what would the, what would the benefit be? That's not, you're not going to get that by looking out the back window. You're going to get it out by, by using a model that, that incorporates some understanding of the causal structure of the situation. So here, we're going to be able to leverage data by incorporating the model very quickly. We're going to be able to benefit the model by keeping it on, by regrounding it. And what our experiments have shown is that you could have a model that's extremely far off. It's built rough and ready, very quickly assembled, maybe um, just as H1N1 has been diagnosed as a new concern. And you know, several months later, um, H1N1 comes to, uh, to Australia. Um, there haven't been the epidemiological studies to estimate certain of the parameters. You don't know about the contact networks that are in place, how much it's, uh, to what degree children are predisposed to it compared to elderly, compared to pregnant women, et cetera. And you could have a very rough and ready model that's built up, and yet new data comes in and it corrects the model. So the model is sort of overestimating things and then it corrects that. And the model's getting savvier. Over time, it learns about the values of parameter values. It learns about the current situation better and better. And it's able to sort of look forward with greater and greater clarity. And so we're making use of these techniques, um, particularly techniques from uh, computational statistics or machine learning called particle filtering that combines models with new data in a way that always keeps the model fresh, always builds in the latest evidence, the newest evidence, um, brought to the table to inform the model, and it prevents how far off the model's going to get. It prevents the model from just gathering dust, gathering uh, increasing obsolescence. So here we have um, uh, we have uh, you know a very aggregate model, perhaps that's rough and ready. We've assembled it quickly, and we have new data coming in that's correcting it, and then feeding back to compare with with new data as it comes in. So we've done quite a bit of work in this area for TB, for West Nile virus, for H1N1, as well as some more theoretic work demonstrating it, the strength of its benefit and found really substantive benefits. The final thing, which I'm just going to uh, hint at here because of the, uh, the time involved, is this issue of understanding and nudging microbehavior. Um, Condition after situation after situation, people's responses, for example, to tobacco messaging. Pro tobacco messaging from tobacco companies, often online now, often through a variety of, of uh, devious channels, um, or anti tobacco messaging from public health campaigns, like led by our partners, American Legacy Foundation. Um, how does that impact? How does that impact people's likelihood of quitting or? likelihood of uptaking with cigarettes, or likelihood of relapsing given that they have quit. That's an example of what I call the microbehaviors. What is it that triggers, makes it more likely that someone, for example, will fall back into smoking? Um, is, it, is it messaging that's part of that? You know, the fact that they see uh, an ad in a gas station or in a bar, um, they see, they see uh, an ad on, in a, uh, uh, in a, in a, on a billboard in the states, or is it the fact that they're around their their fellow smoke, their former social network of smokers, and and you know they they uh, decide to share a smoke with one of them? These are sort of micro behaviors, and they 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 affect the day to day experience of things of great significance, like relapse. But we don't really often understand enough about them to build a really detailed model of what's going on. So increasingly, to ground those sort of models, we are making use of, um, of uh, sophisticated uh, primary data collection technologies based on electronic um, data collection. And this is something which uh, I'll be probably introducing at, at some point within the context of this week, 
but uh, we make use of a smartphone collected data um, that uh, collect data that can be docked with these models, whether it's in the form of representing contact patterns or the form of representing the likelihood that someone will engage in a certain behavior, and, um, and use that to ground the models uh, in terms of some of their assumptions. Um, uh, suffice it to say that through these sorts of data, you can capture amazing behavior regarding um, factors of interest in modeling, which could inform a model, whether it's physical activity over, over geography, whether it's uh, durations that people are together, people's social networks and the social network structure, and you can capture where social contact patterns, uh, social contacts are taking place in what spaces, um, looking beyond the geography and, and reasoning also about spaces such as indoor spaces. Um, and you can cross-link it with other data such as uh, weather data. We, we live in a city which exhibits a certain amount of seasonal variability in Saskatoon. Um, and um, understanding how that seasonal variability impacts people's behavior, their likelihood of, of taking vehicular transportation or active transportation, their likelihood of engaging in smoking when it's minus 35 outside, um, how, does that, how does that end up impacting the behavior? These are things which we can collect by capturing their movement patterns together with cross-links with things like weather with things like environmental sensors uh, run by um, the, the public health authorities for things like air quality, and linking them to GIS databases that have information on parks and location of, of service outlets, et cetera. So increasingly, we turn to this, this uh, mis misnamed notion of big data, these increasingly available electronic data sources that bring the four Vs of big data, as, as talked about by Google, volume, Larger sample size, for example, um, of revealed preference data about how people behave um, can more firmly under ground your, be your model of people's decision-making rules um, or ground their understanding of, of how their social networks evolve over time in different contexts. The velocity of the data is larger, so you get data very, very frequently, so you can leverage these predictor corrector models, these models that, that keep the model honest. There's a greater variety of data we can capture on the same device information about people's social contact patterns and physical location and aspects of their physical activity and aspects of their sedentary behavior, all on the same device. And finally, the model collects information in a way that's uh, often rather more accurate than if you had elicited this information by traditional survey instruments a month later. It can, it can allow for reports that are closer to the stimulus, of proximate, you know, temporally proximate to the stimulus, um, and that exhibit less uh, recall bias because of that, and that um, are more like, are likely to, uh, to have less uh, respondent bias and less bias due to an interviewer's um, uh, being present. So here there's a natural synergy between these dynamic models and data. Broadly speaking, the big data, can ground our models, can take the models out of the realm of speculation and tie them into actual observation concerning health behaviors, health exposures, the exposome, as it's increasingly called in the states, our exposures to different environments, different influences. And it can provide a rich database to, to, to tie that model down in the form of parameterizing it and the form of calibrating it. And it can help stimulate dynamic hypotheses Models make sense of this data, and they make sense of it so that we can ask what-if questions, so that we can tie it in with the outcomes of possible choices, particularly in the, in the policy space or the intervention space. Um, so the models here leverage the data, make sense of it, and spot inconsistencies between that data and, the, um, uh, and, our, and uh, our understanding. So we've made use of a variety of techniques for interfacing these models with, with these sorts of, of data that are, um, that are increasingly available to us. Um, okay, um, so a couple high-level points and we'll wrap up here. I've used more than my time. Um, so addressing complex health uh, interventions um, requires a versatile set of, of tools. Um, there's many powerful tools for enhancing modeling of complex health interventions. And I believe a plural approach that uses multiple techniques for, based on their strengths and weaves them together um, 
to address particular questions is going to be like to be much more valuable than throwing your 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 um, hat with one particular camp modeling camp or another. Um, and critically, uh, having a, an uh, incremental model development process which leverages cross-disciplinary teams and where the model is built as part of the team, not outside of the team and delivered to it, but instead is built in an embedded way within the team, is likely to deliver much more value than, than the, the traditional model of providing black boxes. Um, such models are, however, learning tools. And as any sort of understanding, of human understanding, they're likely to remain fallible for a long time. Um, they, they are no crystal balls. They help us, though, discover the inconsistencies in our understanding much sooner. They help us learn from our mistakes much more quickly. Um, and I think a key need here is to remain humble about the models, represent they're capturing our best understanding, our best guesses for what's going on, um, and to cross-link them richly if possible with empirical data. Tie them down with what you can with empirical data when the goal of the model is to really speak to a particular context. There are other uses of models that are much more stylized, where the model is seek to give some ahas. It's a sort of caricature of a model that that communicates a few essential truths and is not so tied with data. It's more to think through the implications of assumptions. But when you have a model that aspires to, to be empirically, um, empirically grounded and to speak to a particular context, keeping it tied in with, in an ongoing way with data is very important. So those are all my comments for this particular presentation. Um, I know those comments are at a very high level. And starting tomorrow, we'll be seeing lots of particular models. You'll get your hands on sort of interaction with those models. And uh, later this afternoon, we'll, uh, we'll be back to, to talk uh, at the end of the afternoon about some ways this work ties in with the exciting design thinking work that, that will be presented. OK, so thanks very much. Thank you, Matt. And before we break for lunch, Jacob is going to come in and talk to us. Jacob is a general practitioner.